Amen. We also want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, we give God thanks uh, for all the saints that uh, continue to fellowship with us, who continue to join us into this in this wonderful teaching. We have been studying the book of Ephesians uh, for the past couple of months, and we're just so grateful and thankful for all the people of God who continue to join us. Uh, tonight, our topic is the truth and the spirit. The truth and the spirit. And our text tonight comes from Ephesians chapter number one, verse 13. As you do know, we have been doing a verse by verse uh, interpretation and just a commentary on uh, the book of Ephesians. We're studying uh, tonight. We want to look at Ephesians chapter one, verse 13. And again, uh, our topic tonight is the truth and the spirit, the truth and the spirit. I'm just going to ask you to join us in prayer. Again, we thank for all our friends, our loved ones, uh, those visiting um, from all over. Uh, we pray that this teaching is a blessing to you. Let us pray. Father, we thank you tonight for yet another opportunity to go into your word. Lord, I pray tonight that you would touch your people. I pray, Father, tonight that you strengthen your people. Lord, I pray that you continue to empower your people. Father, you are our rock our savior and our guide. We ask you, Father, that every word that is spoken will be a blessing to some soul. We ask you today, Father, that you would touch the hearts of individuals that are searching. Father, give them more of your word. Lord, Father, I pray you reveal yourself in a greater measure, especially in this time and in this season. Your will be done tonight as we say thank you. Bless every heart in Jesus' name. Bless the Lord. And again, one time, one more time, we're just thankful for all the brethren uh, who joined on in. Uh, we pray that uh, this teaching will be a blessing. And uh, you're probably not going to learn anything new. Uh, you're probably uh, just listening to things that you already know. But it, it's just good to get reinforcements from the word of God. And uh, our text, again, is Ephesians chapter number one, verse 13. In whom ye also trusted. After that. Ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. First thing I want to look at is the term in whom, in whom, not in what, but in whom. In whom tells us that Paul is referring to a person, an individual, and not a thing. And that's important to start off. And so we pray that, that the Lord will speak to every one of us tonight. Amen. In the name of the Lord Jesus, truly God, is a present help in the time of trouble. Amen. And we give God thanks for his blessings and his continual love towards us. We have been looking through the book of Ephesians and we see that throughout the past, uh, say 12 passages, we are Christians. We are sons of God because God works out his own plan. You see, we've been through 12 verses so far and everything has been discussing what God has done we've gone through 12 verses and we haven't even gotten to the part on what our participation or what our responsibility is in salvation the, last, the first 12 verses have totally been about what God has done in the life of the believer and so child of God before you can be saved before you can do anything, we have to recognize that everything we are and everything that we have become is simply because of God, only because of God, what God has done. Now, in working out his plan, God uses different methods to make us understand and receive the inheritance which he has prepared for us. And so tonight we're going to be looking at how is it that God brings out his perfect plan? How does God work it out? And we know that 
in past scriptures, he has purposed, he has planned, he has set things up. Now we're getting closer to what the actual operation looks like. And, and tonight is going to be powerful. Verse 13, Paul says that in whom ye also trusted. After that, he heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. This verse illustrates the way in which God makes Christians. And it is important to know that it is God that makes the Christian. It is God that calls. We, we've been studying it. It is God that plans. God purposes. God works. God does all of the work before we've done anything, before we were even a thought. And there is the term predestination before the foundations of the world. We're not going to get back into that. We've been dealing a lot with that. This verse really looks at the operation and it describes the method and the how God accomplishes his will for souls to be saved. We can look at the book of the Acts, the apostles, and the Lord Jesus, who is the head of the church, to whom this work has been entrusted, left only a handful, small group of people on earth when he ascended into heaven. And the scripture reminds us that we should not despise the day of small things. God does not lead a whole lot of people to accomplish a great work. Matter of fact, God prefers to use small things and a small amount of people because that way, when the mission and when the purpose has been complete, God gets the glory out of it. The, the little individuals that God used cannot get the glory because they were simply incapable of fulfilling the purpose and the mandate of God. So God uses, as we've studied, the weak things of this world to confound the wise. It seems impossible that a great plan could be carried out by a handful of people. And we see the mockery at the cross. We see how uh, they mocked Jesus Christ and they told him, come down from the cross if you be the son of God. And, and they jeered at him and, and, and we've looked at that. Uh, they thought that it was over. They thought that it was finished for the son of God. And when they saw, when we look at the small group of individuals, you, you would think that God is not in this. God cannot be in this because, first of all, the head of the church, the, the, the leader of this group dies, and then the followers scattered. So it looks like the end. It looks like it's finished. It looks like there's no hope. But it happened. Salvation took place. Pentecost took place. The infilling of the Holy Ghost took place. The apostles were told to wait in Jerusalem until the Holy Ghost came upon them. And we all know the story, Acts chapter 2. To those of you who don't know it, the beginnings of the church took place when Jesus Christ ascended into heaven. And when he, he ascended into the heavens, the Bible says that he told his followers to go into Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the receiving of the Holy Ghost. And when you read Acts chapter number two, you get to understand that they waited 10 days. They waited 10 days for the promise of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we believe that they were in the upper room. They were praying. They were waiting. And if you can imagine, uh, sometimes, you know, we're waiting for God and, uh, you know, we wait for maybe two hours and then we give up. But these disciples waited 10 days for the promise of the Spirit. And the Bible says that on the day of Pentecost, Pentecost was a Jewish festival. We won't get into it. But when you study scripture, you see that God does things on these special days. Because they're symbols and they're significant as to the purpose of God and, and what God has mandated before the foundations of the world. But the Bible says that as they waited for 10 days, now when you think of 10 days waiting for anything, 10 days seems like a long time. 
But the Bible says in Acts chapter 2 that suddenly there came sound of a rushing mighty wind and entered into the room where they were. And they all were one accord. The Bible says that tongues of fire sat on each and every one of them and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they all spoke with tongues, new language, a language that they were not taught as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. Acts chapter 2 verse 4 says, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. That's Acts chapter number 2 and verse 4. This God did to show that the promise of the Comforter was, has come rather, and it, it shows that when God makes a promise, he will fulfill it. Uh, this is the promise of the inheritance. This is the promise of the Spirit of God that all those who believe, and now it is important for us to understand that the first sign of anyone that has received the gift of the Holy Ghost is the evidence of speaking in tongues. That has not changed. That is still the same way which God works. God worked it like that on Pentecost, and God is still doing it that way. So for those of us who be to believe, for us to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, there must be that initial sign of speaking in tongues. And it's not something you do yourself. The Spirit gives you utterance and unction to do it. And then when they spoke in tongues, the Bible says that they were to preach the word. They were supposed to be witnesses. So again, one of the first things that anybody that comes to the church, once they've received the Holy Ghost, the first thing they should do is they should be a witness. A witness meaning they should declare to somebody, to clear to their peers what has happened in their life. That's a responsibility. That is a mandate of the church. Every individual should declare the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is our responsibility. The disciples obeyed and began to witness about Jesus Christ immediately. The Bible says that because there were many devout Jews in Jerusalem at the time uh, from different languages, when they spoke in tongues, the Jews from different languages understood what they were saying. So there was a purpose to them speaking in tongues. It wasn't just to show that a miraculous uh, event had taken place, but there was a purpose behind it because God would allow them to speak in various different languages to the Jews that were in the area at that time. So there was a purpose to their tongues. However, speaking in tongues is very still important. It is the initial sign, the initial sign of the infilling of the Holy Ghost. And so the disciples, because now they were empowered by the Spirit, they were given great power and might. And that's one of the signs of someone who has received the Spirit is the gifting begins to operate in them. But the first and initial thing for every Holy Ghost believers, they must be a witness. They must preach and testify of Jesus Christ. You don't need a pulpit to preach. All you need is the Holy Ghost. Once the Holy Ghost has come upon you, you are a witness because the Spirit of God lives on the inside. Now, this is God's way of making Christians out of us. People of God, this way has not changed. Jesus Christ said to Nicodemus, you must be born of the water and of the Spirit. While Peter was preaching, and the Bible says he was preaching through the Holy Ghost. When those certain listeners heard him, the Bible says that they were pricked within their hearts. And they asked the question, what shall we do? And then Peter gave them the method, the mandate, the formula. It is repent and be baptized every one of you for the remission, for the removal of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost not many days hence. 
for us to receive the Holy Ghost. It is something that we should go to God for by faith because it is a promise. God promised that he would do it. And if they had to wait in Jerusalem for 10 days to receive the Holy Ghost, then we are to also go and wait for the fulfillment of the promise. If you notice the disciples, they obeyed the word of the Lord and they believed and waited until the fulfillment of the promise. All this is accomplished through the word of truth, the gospel of our salvation. If you notice the method, Jesus spoke to them. Jesus gave them the truth. They believed, they obeyed, they went to Jerusalem and they waited in prayer until they received the promise. The apostle Paul calls it the word of truth. The word of truth. Anything that Jesus says is truth. Now, it doesn't mean it is simply a true word. It doesn't mean it's just simply a true word. These are not more than that. It means truth by which we receive salvation. So this is a very specific truth. How is man saved? How is man to be saved? By the word of truth. It is a word that reveals a given truth. And when we see this truth, when we receive this truth, we understand it as the greatest truth we have ever known. Once it has been revealed to us, once our understanding has just a little bit been opened up, once we find out the good news, once God has allowed us to see salvation, it is the greatest thing that has ever happened to us. And here's the powerful thing. You can hear the gospel message thousands of times. But then there's just that one time when you hear it. It affects you. It does something to you. That's your time. That's your call. God is using this moment to call you. Now, here's what the truth gives. The word of truth tells us about the Lord Jesus Christ. This truth tells us about his person. And this truth tells us about his work. So we're looking at the Lord Jesus Christ. We're looking at his person and we're looking at his work. It is the good news about who he is and what he has done. So it's the good news about his person and his work. So we just don't only preach Jesus Christ, but we want to get personal with him. And we get personal with him through prayer, through meditation. We get personal with him by speaking with him, knowing that he's there. For those of you who need to be filled with the Holy Spirit, it comes by faith. You've got to go down on your knees and pray and continually ask God, Lord, fill me with your spirit. And when the Holy Ghost comes, you will speak with tongues. And everybody around will know. That and only that. The good news about who he is and what he has done. Only that and that alone. Nothing else is the good news. The good news is not God is love. The good news is not the creation. The good news is not I'm going to feel good. The good news is not I'm going to get a car, I'm going to get a house. The good news is about the person and the work of Jesus Christ. That's it. Nobody can become a Christian apart from the word of truth. Nobody can be saved apart from the word of truth. Nobody can accept Jesus Christ except by the word of truth. It is the word of truth which God uses. God uses his word. It is the word of truth as it relates to salvation. How can man be saved? 
It is through the gospel of our salvation. God uses the gospel of salvation. God uses the word of truth. And Paul uses these terms interchangeably. Uh, they, they, they go together because truth is as it relates to the salvation of the soul of man. It is through the message that was delivered to the apostles. Jesus gave the apostles the message. When he told them to wait for them in Jerusalem, he trained them for three and a half years. And as he trained them, he said, I'm going to send the comforter because I'm going to the father. The comforter is another word for the Holy Spirit. And the same exact message that Jesus Christ gave to the apostles. That's what they were empowered to deliver unto us. And so the authentic word of Jesus Christ has been passed down to the church. Salvation is more than just putting up your hand and saying, I want to be saved. One has to accept Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. And we've got to accept the work that he has done on the cross. We have to know about the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Consider the person who has been without God their whole life. And they have been living a life of sin. Look at that individual. All of a sudden, the person hears the word of God. They hear the gospel message. And now they might have heard the message before. But there's something different this time. Many of us can relate to that. There's something about this time. All of a sudden, the person finds a new interest in God. It was never there before. Uh, the Bible might have been boring to them, or perhaps they did not understand it, and they didn't want to understand it, or didn't even think about it much. But there was something different about when you heard the gospel message this time. Because this is your call. This is the call of God in your life. God will not allow you to walk out of that service or leave that particular moment the same. Already, the spirit is operating on the individual. Now, I'm not saying that the individual has been filled with the Holy Spirit. You got to be careful what you say these days because individuals can misconstrue what you're saying and suggest that you're preaching another gospel. The spirit is working. On the individual. The Bible says that none can come to the Father except the Spirit draw him. So the Spirit is already operating. The fact that you wanted to accept the baptism in Jesus' name is a sign that the Spirit of God is operating on you. You have an interest in the Bible all of a sudden. You want to learn the Bible. You want to pray. You want to, you want to, you have a desire to understand more. And sometimes you get a little frustrated because you, you, you don't understand everything. And, and so you're, you're hungry and you're thirsty for more. This is because of the spirit of God. This individual begins to think that God can help him. Your life probably was messy or complicated, let's say. But now, after you heard the message of Jesus Christ, you begin to think, rather you begin to believe that perhaps God can help me and my situation. You might have personal problems. You might have issues. Now the person begins to read the Bible. They begin to pray. And now they begin to worship. They might be a little shy at first. But over time, they get to understand that, look, I have to do this. Sometimes you might not even understand fully why, but you know it's something you have to do. You begin to fall in love with Jesus. So then the Christian is one who realizes that his entire position depends 100% solely upon the person and the work of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's it. 
a Christian understands that their whole being, the whole reason why they are who they are, is because of Jesus Christ, his person, and what he has done. The word of truth, the gospel of our salvation is essential. And that's why we're in this class, because we want more, and we're going to get more. The good news is more than just the need to worship God and, and to please him. It's way more than that. Matter of fact, that's not even the good news. Yes, God is love, and yes, we need to worship God, and yes, we need to please him. But the good news is to be told of what God has done for us in Christ. Everything starts with the Father. The two are one. We're not talking about two separate individuals. We're not preaching two gods. That's not what we're doing. The good news is to be told of what God has done for us in Christ. That is the gospel. The Apostle Paul exhorts young Timothy and says, Timothy, preach the word. He says, be instant, in season, and out of season. Now, when you preach the gospel, you're going to be misunderstood. When you preach the gospel, you're going to be lied on. When you preach the gospel, you're going to be ostracized, opposed, attacked, stoned. We read of ordinary Christians in the book of the Acts who went everywhere preaching the word of God. That's Acts chapter number eight, verse four. You can read that for yourself. Preaching the word doesn't mean that you have to declare uh, the word of God from a pulpit. You can see somebody on the street and you can start preaching to them as long as you have the Holy Ghost. Because that's the initial purpose of the receiving of the Holy Ghost is to be a witness. When speaking truth to the Thessalonians, here's what the Apostle Paul says. Paul says, they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you. And now ye turn to God from idols, thank you, Lord, to serve the living and true God and to wait for the Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Praise God. That's 1 Thessalonians chapter number 1 and verse 9. Before we can begin to talk about living happy, feeling good, and having a better life, we have to be aware of the need of being delivered from the wrath to come. There is a judgment to come. The prophets of old prophesied about it. There is a judgment coming to this earth. And we have to recognize that God has to come and judge evil and sin. We cannot be Christians without having a conviction of sin. We have to be convicted. Now, again, sometimes you will go through a season of conviction of sin and individuals will believe that you're preaching a, a gospel of sin. Every individual, it doesn't matter how long you've been in church, the Holy Ghost will convict you of sin. You have repented. You're living a clean life. You're living a pure life. But it is the Spirit of God in you will convict the believer of sin. Sometimes you'll go through a season of conviction. We're all convicts. And we all should have faced the wrath of God. We all should have been dead because of our sins, literally. Because the wages of sin is death. And there comes that season where every individual has to realize the sin 
that we were in, the life that we live in it. And it brings a conviction and it brings sorrow to the soul. God does not condone sin. God does not uphold sin. The gospel does not uphold sin. But before we can get to a certain level, we have to have that conviction, godly sorrow for sins committed. To be a Christian means that we realize we are guilty before God. And I don't care if you've been in church for 30, 40, 50 years. There will become a season when guilt will hit the believer, the mature child of God. You're righteous, you're holy, but God sometimes will convict you of sin, convict you of past sins. And we're all under the wrath of God because of sin. And it's important for every believer in Christ to remember that. Paul said, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? He wasn't preaching sin. He wasn't preaching that it's okay to sin. He was preaching about the struggles and the challenges that he had. Apostle Paul preached the same message to the learned philosophers in Athens. And he told them, he said, God had appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by Jesus Christ. People of God, judgment is coming. God is going to allow this earth to burn. There is a judgment coming. It is the day of judgment. God's going to judge the quick and the dead. By nature, we're all under the wrath of God. By nature, because we all have sinned. The folks don't like to talk about this. And we're not preaching on righteousness. We're not preaching that it's okay. That's preposterous. What we're preaching is that the nature of man has a propensity to sin. God has delivered us. But if we're not careful, Paul said, within me I find another law. We're not preaching another gospel. We're preaching the same gospel of Jesus Christ. Before we begin to ask for happy feelings, before we begin to ask for joy, we have to realize the dangerous position that we're in. Outside of Jesus Christ is judgment. Outside of Jesus Christ is chaos. We need to be delivered from the wrath to come. We need a savior. The good news of salvation is that we can be delivered from the wrath to come. Now that's good news. This is the good news that the scripture is talking about. This is the good news that the Bible is referring to. The Lord Jesus Christ has taken the wrath on himself, on our behalf. Now, people of God, when we understand the nature of the wrath of God, when we understand the judgment and the wrath that is to come, we realize that salvation truly is good news. Thank you, Lord. In writing to the Corinthians, the Apostle Paul makes a clear statement that his work as a preacher was to declare that all things are of God. People of God, all things are of God who has reconciled us or sorry, reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given unto us the ministry of reconciliation to wit that God was in Christ. There it is. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. You remember many times Jesus said, it is not I that do it the work, but it is the father in me. Jesus said, what I see the father do that I do. Jesus said that the words that I have, he has given me, that's what I give unto you. Jesus continued, he said, the Father and I are one. 
I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Jesus prayed this constantly and declared this to the Pharisees. Not imputing their trespasses unto them and hath committed unto us, that's the preachers, the word of reconciliation. Preaching is not to show how intelligent we are. Preaching is not to destroy others. Preaching is not to, to show how good we are. Preaching the word of God is to reconcile man back to God. That was the ministry that God, what is that word reconciliation? It is bringing back man back in relation to God. It's not to put somebody down. It's not to insult people. It's not to disrespect people. It's not to show individuals how educated I am and how much of the scriptures I own. I know the purpose of preaching the word of God is to reconcile. There must be a word of reconciliation, man, back to God. So now then, we're ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead. Be ye reconciled to God. That is the preacher's mandate. Whether by rebuke, whether by reproof, whether by exhortation. We must be reconciled. Man must be reconciled back to God, because this is the whole plan of salvation. It's not to insult people. It's not to show how good I am. It's to show individuals that, look, God wants you reconciled back to him. So as ambassadors, that is the duty of the preacher. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. It is only by being in Christ that we are righteous. Living in Christ. This is the same message that we have been preaching since we started this. We have not gone outside of the word of God. Anybody that is to be holy and blameless can only do it by doing being in Christ. Anyone who is a son, anyone who is adopted, anyone who's predestinated, anybody who is called, anybody who has been foreordained must be in Christ. All right, so here's the good news of salvation. The good news of salvation, and we have five points here. Point number one, God has done all in Christ. God has completed the work of salvation in Christ. Number two, he has delivered us from the wrath to come. There was a time where we always heard messages about hell and judgment. We need to understand that God has delivered us from the wrath of God. Number three, he has reconciled us to himself. So we have been reconciled back to God. Number four, he has prepared an inheritance for the church. He has prepared an inheritance for the people of God. And, and number five, he has made us his children, adopted sons. Praise God. So let me go through that again one more time. God has done all in Christ, number one. Number two, he has delivered us from the wrath to come. Number three, he has reconciled us to himself. Number four, he has prepared us sorry, he has prepared an inheritance for us. And number five, he has made us his children. Praise God. We're so thankful. So the message of salvation is that God has forgiven us by taking all our sins and placing them on our Lord Jesus Christ. The Pharisees hate the gospel. The Pharisees do not like the message of salvation because they love to keep people in bondage. 
the Pharisees who pretend to be righteous, who act righteous, who always see the faults in others, but never see the faults in themselves. The Pharisee would rather insult somebody else publicly to make themselves look good while they hide their sins. God has forgiven us and has given us all these benefits, the benefits of salvation. You've got to recognize the Pharisee. The Pharisee can be living in sin and will point out the sins of others and will never reconcile a soul back to God because their mandate is to judge others and to put others down publicly so that themselves look good. Christians have a knowledge of the truth through the scripture. Scripture says, God will have all men to be saved. Please don't go and say that I said that every person on the earth is going to be saved. That's not what the Bible says. God will have all men to be saved. God will have all men that are to be saved. They will be saved. All those that God has called will be saved. We see in the book of Acts of the apostles that while Peter or Paul preached, watch this, some believed and some did not. It is important for us to understand as much as they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, the apostles, they were empowered on high. And whether it be Peter, whether it be Paul, whether it be John, whether it be James, when they preached, there was always a division. Some believed and some didn't. Individuals have reasons why they don't believe in you. Individuals can believe in you one time and they don't believe in you anymore. Whatever the case may be. Some believed the message and some simply did not accept it. There's always going to be a divide when it comes to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The apostles were sometimes stoned to death. We all know when the apostle Paul rebuked the demon out of that woman. Oh, they, they slaughtered him. They drew him out of that city. They stoned him. But Paul got back up and started preaching the gospel. Men tried to kill the apostles. When you decide to preach the gospel, you're going to become a target. And sometimes you're going to be a target amongst your own peers. You better preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation. That's what God has called us to do. All right, we've been speaking about the truth, the word of truth. Let's look at the Holy Ghost now. The Holy Spirit. It is important for us to recognize that the presentation of the word of truth alone by itself does not accomplish the work. The word alone does not do it. To Bible scholars or individuals who will go to seminaries, they will go to Bible schools, they'll go to Bible colleges. But you'll notice there's something missing because the Holy Ghost needs to be a part of the work or else the work will be futile. The other essential factor is the work of the Holy Ghost. It is the spirit that applies the word of God, the word of truth. There's the spirit of God. So it is good to know the word. It is good. And when you have the Holy Ghost, you will have that spirit of reconciliation. When you have the Holy Ghost, you will reconcile men back to God. The apostle says, our gospel came not to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. That word assurance is confidence. When the apostles preached these things, they, they didn't give you a whimsy, whimsy preaching. It was confident. It came with power. It came with strength. And it came with conviction. The work of the Holy Ghost is essential to the Christian doctrine. 
And the work of the Holy Ghost comes when the Spirit of God moves in the life of an individual. You will be changed. Something miraculous takes place in the life of the child of God. We have to ask the question, do I have the Holy Ghost? In this time, in this season, do I have the Holy Ghost? There were days when our former pastors and bishops, uh, they would send people back to the altar to go tarry and wait again for the Holy Ghost. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with going back for another touch of the power of God. There's nothing wrong with going back uh, to see, to get another touch from God. Because the Holy Ghost can be poured out more than one time. You need another touch, go on some fasting, go on some prayer, and stay at your bedside and, and pray and say, Lord, fill me again. Give me another touch. It's scriptural. The message of the gospel of salvation was delivered to all men. It is for all men, but all men did not receive it. All men did not accept it. It is the work of the Holy Spirit that makes the difference. It is the Holy Ghost that makes the difference. You can preach like an archangel. Many can come to, to know God. Paul said it, that the, the gospel is preached. But you'll know. The Apostle Paul speaks about the mystery given to him to preach. And you remember we studied the word mystery. Um, if you're not familiar, you can go back to our teaching on our YouTube channel, the mystery of his will. The mystery of his will. Here's what Paul says. Which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And that's taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 8. What is Paul talking about here? If the princes of the world knew that killing Jesus was going to bring glory to the church, they would never have killed him. If the princes of the world knew that Jesus Christ was the Messiah, they would never have killed him. But watch what it says. None of the princes of this world knew. They didn't have knowledge. Because if they would have known, they would never have crucified the Lord of glory. They would never have done it. You see, the princes of the world did not recognize the truth. And they did not recognize Christ. Why? And we've all been there before. They did not recognize the truth. They did not recognize Christ. Why? How is it that people became Christians? If the very princes, if the wise and prudent did not receive the truth, and if they did not recognize Christ, how is it that these individuals became saved? God revealed the truth to them. By his spirit. People of God, don't get upset when you're telling people about the gospel and they don't understand. God has opened up your understanding. Don't make pe let people make you feel weird. Don't let them make you feel strange. You are a treasure. You are precious in the sight of God. God has opened up your eyes to be a part of this great purpose. You are blessed. Because God has opened up your understanding. When your eyes were blinded, God removed the blinders from your eyes so that you can see. Now, God does not do anything against your will. So it's not that God forced you to do anything. But all God did was allow you to see. Watch what 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10 says. For the Spirit searcheth all things. Yea, the deep things of God. 
Let me stop right there. Some of you, you're hungering and you're thirsting after God so much. That's why you're in this Bible study. A lot won't want to be a part of it. And that's good. That's fine. That's their choice. But there's some of you that want more. And that's not you, but it is the spirit of God in you. Searching, needing, hungering, thirsting. You're not satisfied with where you are now. And Jesus said, blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. To receive the Holy Ghost, you got to get hungry. You've got to be thirsty. Are you praying and asking God every day to fill you? Look, no man can believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Except from the work of the Holy Ghost. So the Holy Spirit is already working. You can't come to God. You can't come to God unless the Spirit draws you. To the natural man, these things are foolishness. Don't mean anything. The teachings are foolishness. The teachings don't make sense. I don't understand them, and I don't want to understand them. Watch what 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 says. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness unto him. Watch 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3. No man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Child of God, you want to get closer. You want to get deeper. There are deep things in God, and, and that's why you're on this study. And that's why you're here tonight. And that's why some of you, you're going to listen to this more than twice. Because you want to understand the deep things. Now, tonight's lesson it may be deep for some, but there are individuals, they want more. There's an example, there's a story in the book of, of, of the Acts, uh, Acts 16. Uh, there's a name, lady named Lydia in Philippi. There was a small group of women, and I love the word of God because the Bible does not always deal with masses. You know, sometimes you see a group of people, uh, we look at the numbers and we're discouraged. But God does mighty things through small numbers. When you read the book of the Acts, the Bible says that there was a group of women, a small number of women that used to go by the riverside and they would have prayer meeting on a Sabbath day. And I love the word of God because the word of God allows you to see the simplicity of the event. Just a, a couple of women coming together. They're, at the, they're by the river and they came to have a prayer meeting every Sabbath and when Paul found out that these women were there, the Holy Ghost led him there. This is how the Spirit works. It's not always a numbers game. God deals in quality. Paul went there and, and began to minister the word of God and began to talk about the Lord Jesus Christ. Watch what Acts chapter 16 verse 14 says. Whose heart the Lord opened that she attended unto the things that were spoken of Paul. She attended unto the things that were spoken of Paul. It was the Holy Ghost that led the Apostle Paul to this river where just a group of women were having a prayer service. And Paul began to preach Jesus Christ. And it was the gospel message. The Spirit opened up the heart and the eyes of this woman named Lydia. And she became a believer. The hearts of all of us by nature are shut and closed to the truth. If we understand the things that I'll be saying tonight, we should lift our hands and say, thank you, Lord Jesus, because God has opened up our hearts. Something that seems so simple to some is bizarre to others. The word alone cannot open them or soften them. 
because if it's just the word of the, the word alone, some will reject. But the operation of the Holy Ghost is what's absolutely vital and essential. It is the Holy Ghost that can allow you to listen to a Bible teaching for one hour. To many, it's boring because many need music. Many need worship. Many need excitement. Many might even say, my voice is not exciting enough. I'm not screaming enough. The operation of the Holy Ghost, Spirit of God. Let's look at how the Holy Spirit operates. We've got four things here. First of all, the Spirit quickens us. That means the Holy Spirit makes us alive, makes us alive to God, alive to righteousness, alive to holiness, alive to purity. Number two, the Spirit puts life in us from the death of sin. So we're quickened to righteousness, and now we have life after we had death from sin. Number three, the Spirit gives us the ability to believe. Child of God, the only reason why you believe is because of the Spirit operation on you. You might not have been filled with the Holy Spirit yet, with the evidence of speaking in tongues, but the Spirit is operating on you. That's the only reason why you believe the gospel. It's because of the Holy Spirit. And of course, number four, the Spirit gives us a new nature. There's a transformation that takes place. When the spirit begins to operate on the individual, after you've spoken in tongues, after you've had that experience with God, you become a new person. There's a new nature that has been given to you. It is the nature of Jesus Christ to live righteous, to live holy, to live pure, to have a forgiving heart to have love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance that all comes from the Spirit of God as we slowly mature in Christ. Watch what Ephesians number 2, verse 8 says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Did you catch that? By grace are we saved, through faith. So God gave us favor and allowed us to have faith, not of ourselves. Faith is the gift of God. The only reason why you believe is because God gave you the gift to believe. So if you're preaching to others and they have not been given the gift, don't get upset and many may not understand you. But you have to give God thanks because God has opened up the door. When the Spirit breathes upon the Word, He brings the truth to sight. It takes the Holy Spirit to breathe upon the Word of God for something to take place. We see it, and so we believe it. Our eyes have been opened after we've been blinded for years, after we did not understand it for years. God is now opening up our understanding. <coughs> without us knowing it, watch this. Without us even knowing, the Holy Spirit has been working behind the scenes. And as I close, the Holy Spirit is allowing us to hear the truth, to believe the truth, and to trust or hope in the truth. Faith cometh by hearing, so then our ability to hear, we might have been around the arena of the word of God being preached, but there is the time when spiritually we will hear. We hear, hearing, understanding what God is saying and our eyes are being opened. And so because we hear, we believe. Our faith comes by hearing. Faith comes by hearing. Faith, belief comes by hearing the truth. We heard the truth, 
So we believe the truth. And now we hope in the truth. What is the truth? The truth about the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Child of God, the spirit of God and the word work hand in hand. The truth and the spirit work together. If you have yet to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, I invite you to close your eyes. I invite you to pray and let that become your number one mandate. The spirit is already operating on you, but now you need to be filled with the spirit. According to Acts chapter number two, read that chapter and you'll get an understanding of what the outpouring of the Holy Ghost really is. And it is something that God is still doing today. It didn't change. God did not change the method. The method is repent. That means to turn. Be baptized in the name of Jesus. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. If you don't know, if you've never felt the Holy Ghost, go on your knees. Believe. Hear the truth. Believe the truth. And then hope in the truth. In whom he also trusted. After that, he heard the word of truth. The gospel of your salvation. In whom also, after that, he believed. After you believed, child of God, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. I'm not finished with this verse. There's still so much. I think I still have another two weeks with this verse because there's so much here. Uh, we have to deal with the Holy Spirit because there are many believers that need the infilling of the Holy Ghost. Many believers need to be filled with the Holy Ghost, have not yet been filled. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your truth. We thank you for your spirit. Lord, I pray through this teaching, this quiet and timely, in-depth teaching of the word of God, that, Father, it will fulfill your purpose. That, God, you will touch the minds and the hearts of individuals that would listen. That, Father, you will cultivate a hunger and a thirst, Lord, Father, for the word of truth and for the spirit of God. Lord, touch some heart tonight, somebody that desires the Holy Ghost, somebody that is searching, somebody that is yearning, Lord Father, for more. I pray, Lord Jesus Christ, tonight that you will bless every individual that has listened in to this teaching. Dear God, we give you our life and our love. Cover us tonight. Strengthen your people. Continue to empower us through your word and through your spirit as we say thank you. In Jesus' name.